Bob, thank you for being here. It's a great honor uh, to be for all of us to have you thank here. You, and I want to thank everyone in this audience for being here. And I ask this every time we do one of these events. How many of you have are coming tonight to the Dallas Fed for the first time? Wow. Okay, so that's fantastic. Um, one of the things we're trying to do, and we've been doing this over the last year, is having events like this and opening up the Dallas Fed to the community. We think one of the things that it's very important for us to do is to, one, demystify what the Fed does, which we, we work hard to do, uh, and uh, be a leading citizen in the community. But the other thing is to, uh, we, we, view the, we view the Fed uh, and the Dallas Fed as property of the community. Um, we are a public-private partnership. And so uh, for all of you who are coming here for the first time, welcome. Uh, if I've learned anything in this job, um, it's that we can't do what we do to understand economic conditions, uh, make recommendations for monetary policy, and do the other aspects of what we do without great input from the private sector and understanding what's going on out there. So I'm thrilled that you're here. Thank you for being here. And we look forward to seeing you in future, for future events. And so with that, let me turn to Bob. And let me start. You know, Bob wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post this morning, may have been carried in other papers also. Um, uh, and the topic you talked about was inclusive capitalism, inclusive prosperity. Inclusive growth. Inclus inclusive growth. And I might just start with, why don't you talk a little bit about what does that inclusive growth mean and, uh, and why did you write the op-ed? Well, that's, those are two different questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, I wrote the op-ed because I have a view. We presently have a dysfunctional political system. Congress is unwilling to engage in the process of government. But Milton Friedman said many, many decades ago that even when the political system isn't working, it's important to put ideas on the shelf so that when the day comes, when it functions again, there will be a work product for them to draw on. And I think that's really some, I think it, it, I think it's really a, an interesting observation. And I think what it does is it creates a uh, if you will, uh, uh, almost a responsibility. Well, I, that's a, a moralistic kind of term I don't have to like, but at least it's, it's my view for, for thinking about why it's really important to stay involved, Rob, with policy development. In terms of this piece, I have a very simple notion, and it's one I've had for a long time, which is that if we're going to grow, if we're going to have the kind of robust growth that all of us want to have, it's going to have to be widely shared, and there's going to have to be some real sense of economic security. Otherwise, you're not going to have adequate demand to sustain growth, you're not going to have work, a workforce with the resources to access education, edu health care, and the rest that's important for, for productivity. But most importantly, probably, because you're not going to have support for growth policies like market-based economics and trade unless the American people think they're benefiting from those policies. So I think if you're going to have growth, you're going to have to have widespread participation of benefits of growth, and you're going to have to have a good sense of economic security, and I call it inclusive growth. Similarly, I might add, you're not going to have widespread increase in income if you don't have growth for a whole host of other reasons. So that's why I did that. that that's why I called it inclusive growth. And unfortunately, t although 2015 numbers were somewhat better, I, I kind of think they probably were a one-time event, and I could support that proposition if we get into discussion of it. For many Americans, this economy has not worked well for a long, long time. And, uh, and that is the reality that it seems to me we need to face with public policy, but you can't face it with public. I think there's a lot of things. I think there's a lot we could do. I think there's a tremendous amount we could do, and I think we are tremendously well positioned in terms of our, our inherent strengths in the global economy for the longer term. But none of it matters unless we have a political system that works. How do we get here in terms of wealth inequality and some of the divergences that you talked about in your op-ed? You know, Rob, I, I think the following in the 1990s. We, we had problem in the 1980s. You had a similar problem of, of rough, roughly, I wouldn't say stagnating incomes, but but sluggish growth in incomes, and you also had some job issues. In the 90s, we actually had incomes increasing at all levels. The reason was we had strong growth and therefore tight labor markets. And then we fell back into an era where growth, although not bad, wasn't tight enough to create pressure on. But I don't. Th but I think that something much more fundamental has happened, Rob. I think we have had a we're in a in a in a, in a period of tr of really transformation of our economy. The technological development has had tremendous <coughs> benefits for growth, but has also had tremendous disruptive effects on wages and on jobs. 
And if you look forward, Oxford University has a group that put out a study recently, and it's the conclusion of which is, is debated, but I'll tell you what it said, and I kind of find it rather persuasive, which is that something like 45% of American jobs are going to be at risk over the next five to ten years because of the developments of technology, what they at least view as the likely technological developments. And that could mean very substantial productivity gains, but it also means we have a tremendous economic issue of the kind I've just described to address. So in and your globalization has played some role too, but I think that's vastly overstated in the, in the political environment, though it has, it has played some role, both in, an important role in growth and also some role in, in uh, pressure on wages. And, and by the way, just to enforce, uh, reinforce this, we do surveys with the community and with business leaders, and we have a large number of Fortune 500 companies as well as small businesses. And the impact of what we call disruption, which you're, you're referring to in technological yeah. advances, is really limiting pricing power, reducing margins, and, and causing business leaders to be very hesitant yeah, and but you know, do. Rob, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for a country like ours. We have flexible labor and capital markets. We have a dynamic society. Uh, we have a market-based economy or the rule of law. I, I think that if you look out over the intermediate and longer term, I think all of this is actually opportunity. But the trouble is we're not going to get the benefits of that opportunity unless we also address the pressures that it creates. And that's why I wrote this piece. I mean, so that, that is the, 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 the thesis, if you will, of the, of the op-ed on inclusive growth. So in your article, you talked about a number of things which you and I have talked a bit about and we've been calling for infrastructure spending. You talked about educational attainment. You talked about a number of other, uh, you called structural as well as other policies. Why don't you explain what are some of the, the things that the government generally, economic policy more broadly, needs to be focused on to address this? What I said in the, in the piece was I think we need to have uh, public investment, that is infrastructure, but, and, and that I think there's broad-based agreement on. Where there's not agreement is how do you pay for it? And there's a broad-based view now with the interest rates so low that we should deficit fund it. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a really complex issue, and I've actually hired somebody as a consultant to me to develop a framework for thinking about this. There, there are a lot of variables involved in the effects of deficit funding infrastructure, and I don't know where it all comes out once you finish the analysis and you make the assumptions that go into your, into your modeling, but I, I think it's a very, very complex issue, even though there's a broad-based view amongst many economists now that with rates so low, we should do it. Okay. There are a whole bunch of these conventional areas. There's, uh, we need, I think we, we absolutely and imperatively need to address our intermediate and longer term fiscal trajectory, which is unsound and I think dangerous. And I think we do need structural reform in a whole bunch of areas. But in addition to more conventional structural reform, for example, we need immigration reform, obviously. We need K through 12 education. We need criminal justice reform. Criminal justice, our criminal justice system, I actually know a little bit about this criminal justice system. I spoke at San Quentin about six months ago. Hmm and then wrote an op-ed from the New York Times about it. Our criminal justice is, in addition to being a terrible social issue, is a terrible economic issue. What we are doing is economically nonsensical, as well as, I think, morally reprehensible and, and, and terrible in its effects on the people who are its, I'll call them, victims. Yes, they committed crimes, but that's the beginning of a story, not, shouldn't be the end of a story. But then I think what we need, and this is, I say this, although not as much as I would like to if I'd had more space in this op-ed, then we need a whole bunch of innovative, at least in my view, innovative and creative ideas to deal with the kinds of pressures that technology is creating. And I, I think, Rob, that we need to have lifelong learning. We need to have, and I think you've done some work on this, training that is integrated with business, so that it isn't just training, but it's training integrated with business, so it prepares people for the business, for the jobs that are around, and also provides them the ability to get jobs. I think, though I suspect this is quite controversial, that at some point we may need to have public employment. Maybe it's transitory public employment, maybe it's temporary public employment, Rob, but to enable people who are poor today, who in, in, 40 years ago would have gone into manufacturing and the entry level jobs don't exist anymore, to get work skills that would then prepare them to enter the mainstream workforce. We have a terrible skills gap in our country. The unemployment rate is 4.9%. I think there's actually a lot more slack in the labor market than that unemployment rate indicates. People have dropped out of the labor force. People who are long-term unemployed. People who are part-time workers would like to be full-time workers. And a lot of that is skills gap. A lot of that is their jobs available here, but the people who <coughs> we would like to have fill them don't have the skills. That's, that's a little piece of what I think is a much larger story. So I think this is a great list. And the obvious question is, what, what's the likelihood it's going to happen? Why hasn't it happened up to now? And what's going to take for it to happen? 
President Clinton used to say to us, he was great, but I don't know whether any of you will know or not. He, he was fabulous. I mean, you know, none of us are perfect, but... <laughs> well, it's true. Besides which, I did the economic stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but President Clinton used to say that you can have all the good policy thinking in the world, but if the politics doesn't work, it won't matter because it won't happen. Yeah. And our political system has broken down. And more specifically, what has happened is that there's an unwillingness in Congress to engage in the kind of principled and constructive compromise that our system is absolutely dependent on. I mean, I believe, when I was with President Clinton, I believed very strongly in a whole bunch of things. But I remember when we did the 97 balanced budget agreement, and President Clinton gave up on some things that I really wished we couldn't, we didn't have to give up on. But we wouldn't have done anything we hadn't given up. And Trent Lott gave up, because he was the other side of it. Trent Lott gave up on some things that he felt that way about. The result was we got a terrific bill, the 97 balanced budget agreement, that both of them were very happy to have had, even though they had to give up some things they wanted to get it. But we were, and, we, and we need focus on facts and analysis. I mean, politics will always play a role, but there does have to be focus on facts and analysis, and there has to be a willingness to make difficult decisions. And Rob, all of that is missing in Congress today. So I hate to ask this. And at the Fed, we're sitting here, and, uh, and I've, we've been very vocal about the fact that monetary policy is not an ideal instrument to address many of these structural and other issues you've described. It, it has a role to play, but it's not a substitute for these things. Um, while we're waiting for this to happen, given we're sitting at the Fed and we're agonizing this over this every day, what should the Fed be doing while, uh, while we're waiting and hoping for some of these things to happen? I think the Fed should recognize that they're irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> Now, yeah. I think we throw a good event. In which case, you have all this, I mean, a wonderful event. And you have all this space you could supplement. Yeah, that, right. that, that could be very exciting. Rob, I honestly, truly, I, because I have a job in investment banking and also because I have some consulting relationships, I get to see a lot of people involved in running businesses. I don't think it makes any difference at all, with all due respect, whether you raise interest rates by a quarter, substantively, quarter sure. point or not. It just is not... Part. And the, the, the 10 years, I think, is 170 or something like yes, that? Yes, it's 175. Yeah. If, it were, if it were 180, 185, 190, would that really make a difference in the decision being made? No. Right. I think there are a lot of other factors that are. Now, the one effect that, that it can have is the psychological effect, because the markets are obsessed, <clears throat> irrationally obsessed with the, with the Fed. But if it had, it would, it would be a temporary effect, except under one possible circumstance. If, in fact, markets are overvalued, and I have no view on that subject at all, but if they're overvalued, then the Fed raising the interest rates by a quarter point could be sort of approximate cause, if you will, of, of, a, of a, then a, a prolonged decline. But the prolonged decline is not because the Fed raised rates. It's because the bloody thing, because the markets were over, overvalued to begin with. So I don't think it matters what you do in December. I guess if I were the Fed, look, I mean, I, over the horizon. Over the horizon? Yeah. Rob, I think... I think that we're going other to than calling out these issues and talking about them and uh, calling for other action. No, but I think you should call it because I think we have a moral hazard problem, Rob. Yeah. I think one of the things that's happened here, and I think it's true in Europe, and, and Mario Draghi has done a good job actually of of, of making this point. Yeah. I think one of the things that's happened here, because we have this absurd over focus on or obsession with the Fed in the media with analysts, I think it's taking pressure off the politicians to act. Right. And I think there's a real moral hazard problem. And I think the Fed has a real responsibility to speak out and say, yes, we're, we're maintaining uh, conditions conducive to growth, but we are not the problem. We're not the, we're not the problem and we're not the answer. That's yeah, what I, think I agree, with, I agree with that, actually. So we've taken that approach to a great extent. Now, you and you, for, I wrote a case, some of you may know, on and Bob knows this too well. So uh, let me write a case on him uh, back, uh, I guess it was seven or eight or nine years ago, I forget, uh, about uh, Bob created the National Economic Council. President Clinton, if he were here, would I assure you say he created it. Well, pardon me. And then, <laughs> and then, and then under his aegis, I was in charge of it. Fair enough, better said. Uh, so I wrote a case on how... Uh, but the steps Bob took from the time he got there, um, and during that time, and we were talking about this, Lena, by was by 1997, uh, because of a number of actions, congressional, executive branch, um, the budget was balanced sometime in, I think, uh, mid, to, mid to late 90s. Yeah, it was 98, I think. Okay. First time in 30 years. So, um, having been through that, if you had to give advice to policy leaders going forward, because we've got to look ahead, 
president, executive branch, other policymakers. What what advice would you give on what changes need to be made that could get us where we could take some action like what you've called for? Well, you mean what policy recommendations? Or, or other, I'm uh, thinking broadly, any other actions? And I know this is an impossible question. Well, no, I, I think the problem, Rob, is this. In, in my op-ed, I, I listed a few things. I mentioned them a few moments ago. Look, I think there's a terrific idea. Peter Orzag was, you may remember, he was Obama's initial head of OMB. Extraordinarily bright guy. I know Peter very well. Peter has this idea that we should do is we should have stimulus now. Remember, I said there are a lot of questions about stimulus and so forth. But stimulus now, but it should be enacted at exactly the same time, simultaneously with reforms to put our, our federal retirement programs, entitlement programs, if you will, federal retirement programs on a sound financial footing. And that way, for the, for the longer term trajectory, you would actually be improving the debt to GDP ratio, because while it's true you're doing stimulus now, even if that does have an adverse effect on the long term trajectory, and that's one of the questions we're going to try yeah. to figure out. But, right. Uh, on what assumptions it would, what assumptions it would, but even if it did, under Peter's theory of the case, you'd be you'd be addressing this, this set of long-term issues, both by the entitlement reforms I mentioned, and also by increasing revenues. And we're going to have to increase revenues, whether we like it or not. That's one thing I would do, but the politics of that are impossible, Rob. Okay. Um, let me back up, go in another direction. Um, uh, I knew you obviously, and we were at the same firm. Uh, a long time. Uh, and I knew you. Uh, uh, you were junior to me, though. I was quite. <laughs> I, was, I was quite junior to you. Uh, but uh, well, I remind you, that's all. But I remember even when you were at the when you when I used to know you at the firm, you were talking to leaders and you were thinking about public service. Yeah. What uh, prompted you? I guess it was in nineteen ninety two. December ninety two. What prompted you to decide to leave the firm and go into public service? It wasn't the compensation. I gathered that was the case, yeah. <laughs> you know, Rob, everybody's different. And I'll give you my view of whatever it's worth, of, of how I viewed my life from very early on. I graduated in law school. I went to a law firm for a little over two years, and I, I knew I didn't want to practice law. And then I went to Goldman Sachs. From the very beginning at Goldman Sachs, I knew what I wanted to try to do if I could, which is to try to do well in whatever my business, you know, whatever my career activity was. <laughs> I didn't think I would stay at Goldman, frankly. I didn't think I'd become a partner, and I figured if I don't get a partner, then I'll go someplace else. Well, at least I've gotten good training. So I haven't stayed 26 years, so I was wrong on that. But, but I also always knew, even when I was very young, that I wanted to be involved outside of my business in civic activity and political activity, and politics just fascinated me. I thought the processes, how does this country really work? Would I ever get the opportunity to see the, how this country works from the inside of the administration? And then from early on, I was interested in policy, and I really cared a lot about certain policy issues, more as time went on, but certain policy issues. And while I did get involved in them before I went to government, I found ways to get involved. Uh, government seemed to me offered the opportunity to get involved in, in these issues on a scale that massively exceeded anything I could otherwise do. And so the combination of those two, the desire to understand how our, our system worked by seeing it from the inside of the White House, and then the desire to get involved on this very large scale with, the, with issues that I really did care about, including the issues that we were just discussing. Uh, when, when Governor Cuomo was, was uh, Mario Cuomo was our governor, he asked me to head up a panel on, on the poor, which I did. And then I cared about fiscal issues from early on. So what was the biggest surprise you had when you went from business to the government? You know, I think, I guess I'd give two if I may. When I got asked to be head of the NEC, the National Economic Council, Henry Kissinger, who I knew reasonably well, Henry said to me, he said, you'll be so busy in government that you'll have to live off the capital you've built up before this because you won't have time to develop new intellectual capital. I found just the opposite to be the case. Government for me was just an extraordinarily steep learning curve. And it was the, I was there six and a half years, and for the whole six and a half years, Rob, on substance and also on how our system worked, on politics. So that was one surprise. I guess the other, well, I don't know if it was surprise or not, but that was the experience. The other, and again, I don't know if I'd call it surprise exactly, but the caliber of people that we had, that I worked with in government, were just extraordinary. I mean, Goldman Sachs had really good people, it really does. And I think we had in government every bit comparable, and every bit as committed, and worked every bit as hard. We had just a fabulous group of people in the White House when I was there, in the Treasury when I was there. So I guess that, those were two points that I'd come to. Biggest adjustment going from the National Economic Council to the Treasury? Well, the difference was, <laughs> it's a good, I've actually thought about that. One, one difference was when you're at the NEC, when you're in the White House, 
although I had to be a somewhat public figure, I had no great desire to publicity, and so I didn't go out of my, I didn't reach out for it, and it sort of came with the territory to some extent. But when you're the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, you are the principal economic spokesman for the United States government. Now, obviously, the president is anytime he wants to be, but subject to that, you are the principal economic. And one of the things I learned at Treasury was anything I said, this is probably another thing I learned in government, anything I said had to be said very carefully. <laughs> if I said one day I believed in a strong dollar, and the next day I said I believed in a stronger dollar, all of a sudden the markets would react. <laughs> I remember I was sitting at a hearing once with Larry Summers, Larry and I were there, and I said something about the strong dollar, and then I made some comment, Rob, it was, it was of no substance significance whatsoever. It sounded a little different. And the market started to come apart, and Larry had to run out of the hearing. And to, <laughs> and no, seriously. And to call people in the press and say, that didn't mean anything different. And he just said, <laughs> <"Same> he always <laughs> was. <laughs> now, Alan Greenspan was the head of the Fed yeah. at the time you were in that job. What was your working relationship with him, and what was your philosophy about working with the Fed? Boy, do we have a fabulous working relationship. You know, when I, when I got to the Treasury, I mean, Alan was, and still is, by the way, I was with him last week. We had breakfast. He's massively knowledgeable. He really is. He's a very bright and empirically massively knowledgeable guy. And he could easily have been high-handed and, and, and trod all over me at Treasury. And he did just the opposite. He, he, he treated us just wonderfully. And Larry and Alan and I had breakfast once a week at the Fed. <clears throat> well, sometimes it gets at Treasury, actually. I think mostly at the Fed. In any event, for once a week, for four and a half years, and as Alan said to me last week when we had breakfast together, he said, in four and a half years, the three of us got together, we discussed everything under the world, yeah. except monetary policy. And we got, <laughs> no, we discussed, monetary, well, we discussed economic conditions, what we think the economy's going to look like, all kinds of stuff. And why don't you explain why did and you nothing avoid... nothing ever leaked. Why don't you explain why did you avoid monetary policy? Because we had the view, I had, we all had the view. It took a little while sometimes with some people to persuade them this should be their view, but we all had the view. Not all equally had the view, but that monetary policy really should be the sole purview of the Fed, and for two reasons. One is that it was very important that the Fed be independent of all politics, and it is so easy to politicize the Fed. I mean, I was in the Oval Office sometimes when President Clinton would go back, really would get quite <laughs> distressed. <laughs> Upset. <laughs> <laughs> About some of the actions of the Fed. And he'd say, why don't I say this? He was terrific, by the way, in economic. He understood. President Clinton understood. And we say, no, Mr. President, it, it is absolutely imperative that not be politicized. And secondly, I think the credibility of our markets benefits a lot from the independence of the Fed. It really does. If we ever screw that up, I think it will affect our markets, Rob. So the legislation, which we go in waves where there, this is not the first time there's been legislation calling audit the Fed and other. Yeah, that's absurd. So you'd be very wary of all that. No, I wouldn't be wary. I, I would be massively opposed. Uh, <laughs> okay. I wrote a really there's a there's a book uh, by Roger Lowenstein. Yeah. About the creation of the Federal Reserve. Right. System. We had him down here to speak and explain. Well, I wrote the book. the book review for the New York Times, and it was their cover book review. Yeah. And it, was, it was good. For those of you who want to look up it up, I, I, the book was good, but so was my review. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I said in that review, because you can you know you can you can talk about some stuff that interests you. That I think these ideas, like what well, I think, these are terrible ideas, Rob. Yeah. And the people who are proposing, proposing, I think, just have not understood. Well, at least in my opinion, understood the effects that could have. Okay. A couple of other quick ones, and we're going to the audience. Who was, who were your uh, most influential mentors and coaches as you went through your career? Oh God, I, I've been very lucky in my life. <laughs> A lot of people who really were extraordinary. Um, Gus Levy, who was the senior partner at Goldman Sachs, he, he did a lot of business in Dallas. Some of you probably were on, obviously, very friendly with him. But aside from that, some of you must have known him. He's well known down here. A lot of people around. He was one know. tough guy. I, when I first got there, I worked right with Gus, and I made a mistake. All right, it cost a bunch of money. And he looked at me and he said, let me tell you something. It's better to be lucky than to be smart, and you don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, okay, that seems very funny now, but I want to tell you, I was a brand new assumption at Goldman Sachs, and I didn't find that so amusing at the time. And he was from New Orleans, Southern Drawl? He had a, Louis, he came from New Orleans. Yeah. When he was talking to me, I never heard that. I heard what I do, what I do. When he talked to his clients, you'd think he'd never left New Orleans. It was unbelievable. He really was. So Gus was one, because uh, he really did, have, he, he really didn't know how to run a, a firm, and I learned a lot, but there are a bunch of other people. Uh, there was a man named Bunny Lasker. None of you would, is no name, but Bunny was a big leader in the in the Republican Party in New York, and I learned a lot from Bunny how to navigate, if you want to. But just there's so many others, Rob. 
All right, let's take some Bob questions. Bob Strauss, by the clearly one of them. Yeah, you might just comment on that. Bob was amazing. I mean, Bob, when I went, after I left the Treasury, I went to City. And I was in City Group one day, and I got a letter from Bob. And Bob said, at first, it said, you're the dumbest man I've ever, no, you're the dumbest person I've ever known in business. Now I want you to do the following things for me. <laughs> I mean, he was outrageous. The first time I ever met him, I met him through Joe Fowler, Henry Fowler, who had been Secretary of the Treasury. So he arranged for us to meet. So we meet in some room, and I wanted to be active in politics. So Bob said, uh, I want you to help me raise some money. I said, fine. He said, I've looked at your resume. It looks pretty good. But now that we've met, I don't think you amount to much. I thought to, my, I thought to myself, what? what kind of way is that to recruit me to raise money for you? <laughs> But I learned that with Bob Strauss. He was an amazing guy. And All right. I, I, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have people like that in Washington who really knew how to help make the system work and was really bipolar. He was a yeah. Democrat, but he, he functioned bipartisan. So he, Can I ask one of the questions? Just as where we're, all the Warren, Ru sure. Warren, Warren Redman uh, and others who had the reputation of being uh, working across the yeah, aisle. There are a lot of them. You don't see as many today. You know, it's, it's almost uh, it is very the energy in both parties is on the extremes. Yeah. I was speaking to a senator the other day who I know moderately well, and it was terrific, and basically is a sort of a, a called moderate, he's a Democrat, moderate. And I said, why aren't you more public? And he said, there's really no place in the public debate for people who have views except if they're on the more extreme ends of our parties. All right, so let's take, sir, please go ahead. Mr. Secretary, um, ten-year treasuries are yielding a little over one and a half percent. Money market accounts are less than one percent. Some countries in Europe are paying negative interest rates, and that is foreign investment in an in a interest-bearing uh, yeah. instrument. You get back less than you put in. Do you see this as a possibility for this country? Negative interest rates? Negative interest rates. Well, let me, let me give you this answer. I actually don't, as a matter of fact. But I, I think, I don't know, I may be wrong about this, but I kind of think we have, we're sort of growing about 2% right now. Um, I kind of think we'll probably continue to have it's relatively slow growth. I think we could do a lot better if our political system was functioning, with both both for substance effects and confidence effects. But I think as long as we have growth, and even if even if I, I think the probabilities in the nearer term may be a little more to the downside of the base case. But I don't think we'll get to the point where we'd have negative rates. That's that's my opinion. I may turn out to be wrong, but that's because I don't expect to have economic conditions of a kind that would cause people to think that's a good idea. I think even if we did have those kind of things, I think I probably wouldn't think it was a good idea. Sir. Well, I, I would ask either of you if you thought we'd get a quarter of a percent bump in December if I thought you'd answer. But <laughs> I can answer. <laughs> Nobody cares what I think. <laughs> Um, Mr. Rubin, when you were talking about uh, public employment, it uh, made me think of the public works projects of yeah. the 30s, and it made me think of a revamped version of that. Could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I haven't given a lot of thought to it, but what I, I know a little bit about, not a lot, but a little bit about, there's a wonderful organization called LISC, L-I-S-C. It's, it's a community development organization that, that is dedicated to the mission of combating poverty. It distributed $1.3 billion to inner cities last year. I've been chairman of the board ever since I left Treasury, so I kind of had, had some exposure to issue poverty. We have got to find a better way of enabling the poor to become part of the economic mainstream. And I think with, with manufacturing jobs no longer available as the entry to the economic mainstream, I think maybe public employment will be one dimension of this. I think I mentioned this before, I know I did. Yeah. Both, both so people can develop skills and also have jobs. But even more broadly than that, we may run into a situation in this country where technological development is so dislocative <coughs> that we really are going to need to have public employment to provide work for people as they are preparing. It's probably ho hopefully transitory, but nevertheless, as they prepare for some other part of their life. It may be part of the transition from place to place. And remember, too, work, work is more than just compensation. Work is a, so, is, is, is a sense of self-worth. Work is a sense of yourself, of self-worth. Work, work is a, as I said a moment ago, work is, is, a, is, a, is a focal point for your social life. There's just a great deal more involved self-respect, so there's a lot involved in work. And I, I, think the, I think some analog to the WPA will play a role in our lives in the future. Mr. Secretary, you said you were fascinated with politics. And at one point you said, if I were the Fed, and if you were appointed, so you didn't have to go out on the campaign trail, President of the United States, January, what are the first three things you would do on the first three If I appointed to the Fed? No, no, if, if you're appointed, appointed president of the United States. Oh, appointed president of the United States? Yes, yes. 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 You don't, 
All three things. I'll tell you what, no, I'll tell you what I would do. If, if, if I were appointed president of the United States, I think I'd try to give up the job somewhere. Or other. <laughs> <laughs> but if I couldn't do that, I'd spend all of my energy on trying to, to develop effective relationships in both parties, yeah. in the Congress, and especially the House of Representatives. Because that's where the ball game is. Unless we can get Congress to go into the mode I described before of working together and working with the administration, we are not going to be able to do what we need to do. And that, that's how I would spend my time. Yeah, you really touched on that before, but give us two and three also. That is two and three, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you another one, but it may not be the kind of thing you're looking for. I think one thing we didn't do enough of when I was there, and if, if I could live it again, I would try to do more, but particularly try to get President Clinton to do more. The American people, for the most part, know very, very little about economic matters. And I think we could have done more to try to be a sort of a source of public education. And so if I were the president, I would, I would, try, to, I would try to do that. And I guess if I had to pick a third one, I would take the, okay, my third one is going to be a multiple, multi-headed, multi if you will, multi-headed. Yeah, multi I would develop a small regime, proposed regime of the kinds of items I mentioned in my op-ed today and I would start to try to work with Congress and try to educate the American public so that we can move forward. Thank you. May I ask a question? You talked about, um, I guess I can't ask a question. If, so if, if you talked about educating the public, if you had to pick a couple things that you think the public is particularly uh, not well informed about and places including the Fed could do a better job educating people about, what would they be? What should we be focused on explaining better? I think what's happening, I think the transformation of our economy as a consequence of technological development is going to profound, it's profoundly affected us already. But if, if the Oxford study is right, if the second machine age written by these two fellows up at right. MIT is right, yeah, I've read the book, yeah. and, and I'm inclined to believe that is right. Now, there's a contrary view. There's a view that the technological development is not going to have that kind of impact. But when you look at artificial intelligence and you look at digitization and you look at all else, machine learning, 3D printing and so forth, I, I'm of the view that the, 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 the more likely scenario is this kind of technology. So I would try to educate the Americans about the kind of economy we're going to be facing and the need for a policy regime that's, that, that addresses that, a transformative policy regime. I would try to educate the American people about trade. I mean, yeah. trade is good for the United States. It's not bad for the United States. TPP is something we should be doing, not something we should be opposing. But the problem is, and this, by the way, this problem goes back to when Eisenhower was president. This is not a new problem. The people who are adversely affected by trade are obviously, are obviously very much aware of that. And the benefits, better consumer prices, better choice, uh, more, uh, more competitive manufacturers because they can import certain of the you know, inputs and so forth, are, are, not widely, are not widely recognized. And I, w I would try to do a much better job of educating the American people about the two sides of trade. Now, having said that, there was, the, the government has fallen short because trade does have dislocative effects, and they can be powerful. David Outer at MIT wrote a piece about this recently. So what we have to do is the kind of things I talked about before, which is to put in place lifelong learning and, and training that's that related to, to business skills, or uh, close the skills gap into all the kind. I think public employment, I think a better EI, earned income tax credit, and so much else, so that we can address, effectively address, the dislocative effects it has. Mr. Secretary, <coughs> We try to have solvent banks, strong banks. In the last few years, huge amounts, billions of dollars, have been paid by banks in Europe, United States, and Asia, in settlements and in uh, fines. Could you tell me on what accounts those monies were paid and how it has been spent? Uh, tell me, tell you what, I'm sorry. The, the fines that the banks have paid. Right. Where was it deposited, oh. and who spent it? Rob? I don't know. Where were this? Some of that, actually, I have read, because when there are large fines, I look, some of it goes into a, a so-called restitution fund that is intended to somehow compensate the victim. Some of it goes into the government. Uh, coffers. A lot of this is coming up, particularly recently, because without getting into detailed names, we've got a, a company with a market cap of 12 or 13 billion that just got assessed a 14 billion dollar fine. And I think uh, this is you're, we're going to hear more discussion about this as a result of it.
Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I keep hearing stuff in the media. Like, set, they keep saying that the the national budget is a is actually like not that bad, and it's it's getting uh, lower. But um, if you do some research, and I don't know if any economists can uh, confirm that the national budget is getting worse, and it's getting worse at a greater rate. So my question would be, um, is it getting worse okay. at a greater rate? And if it is, um, we reach a tipping point where um, like nothing can happen when something catastrophic happens. And what happens when it reaches that tipping point? Look, I think those are profoundly important questions. And they're yeah. questions we're totally unwilling to face in the political world. But the, but the simple answer to your question is the deficit to GDP ratio actually has sort of stabilized, give or take. But it, yeah, but, but if you look out in time with the Congressional Budget Office projections, it starts to take off again. And by 20, don't hold me to this exactly, but it, it gets up to about 106 percent of GDP in 25 years or there. Yeah, and the, no, reason, less than 20, the 20 reason years. is the present value of the unfunded portion of entitlements is about $46 trillion. But the way we account for it in the budget, we only account for the underfunding as we spend it. So as Bob says, as we get out five and ten years, you're going to see the budget deficit start moving up again because we've got to work through this big underfunding. Yeah, uh, Rob's got exactly right. The deficit will move up, the debt to GDP ratio will move up, and then you ask the very good question of how much effect is that going to have on our economy. I think there are multiple risks associated with that, and I think it is really very dangerous, and I think we should be addressing it, but there's no political will to address it. I also think that the projected numbers probably understate the reality because we're going to have another major fiscal problem, and that is climate change. Because I, I think there are going to be enormous adaptation costs. Obviously, you want to do what you can to, to have limit the amount of climate change we have. But a lot of it's baked in already, and it, it's cumulative, and it continues to go on. So we're going to have, I think, tremendous adaptation costs, and that's going to be have to be borne by the federal government. No, what, exactly, what at one point, at what point do you really start to feel the, the adverse Im economic impacts? I think you're feeling some of them now in certain respects, but as you go higher and higher, I think they get worse and worse. And ultimately, you could have uh, serious disruptions in financial markets. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, one. Uh, well, I think you get one question. No? Oh, let's, 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 let's let this gentleman right behind you. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. Thank you, though. I'm probably going to ask his follow-up question. Good. <laughs> Perfect, then. I'm a member of the HBS community, and I wanted to tell you, we, those in the alumni organization appreciate your work in Cambridge. Uh, my question is, based on a lifetime of finance, how have we gotten ourselves in a spot where after... 5,000 years of finance history, we've somehow figured out how to lend people money and uh, have them not pay for it. Uh, you know, lend somebody $100 million and say, pay me back $99 million. It, it looks like the world of finance turned completely upside down, disconnected from the economic laws of gravity. <laughs> and lots of groups of people sit around and talk about it. And it, it sounds like, oh, it'll, it'll all be fine. The deficit's up over $100 billion this year. We're not really at war in a traditional sense. The economy is growing. We've had growing tax revenues, and yet every year the deficit's bigger. How, how can the Fed go up on interest rates and not correspondingly <coughs> jack up the cost of the debt that the federal government already has and squeeze out the entire budget? Well, you, 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 maybe I'll let Rob take part of that, but, but your basic point is right, though it's not the only, it, one of many risks of where we are is that as the debt to GDP ratio goes up, the interest costs of the federal government, even if interest rates don't go up, are going to go up. That's going to, excuse me, squeeze out public investment and squeeze out resources available for national security. And then if, if as a consequence of increasing debt to GDP ratios, the markets become less confident about our future financial prospects, then interest rates could also go up, and so that'll, that'll increase the effect that I've, or exacerbate the effect that I've just described. But that's only one of many risks. It, it looks very much like the Chinese metaphor about riding a tiger. How, how do you unwind $10 trillion worth of negative interest bonds? You, you, you can unwind where we are. You could have the political will. We, we could sit, I think if you got a, I, I know, right? <laughs> If you, if you got a group of people together, like Peter Orzak, who I mentioned earlier, and people who really understand the federal budget, 
and Rob, I'm sure, understands it well. I think I probably have a little bit of understanding of it. You could come, that isn't the problem. A very conservative, a very conservative uh, economist whose name I think all of you recognize, but I'm not going to mention it, he served the Reagan administration, and I'm, I know extremely well, said to me the other day that if he and a similarly liberal economist got together, and if they were willing to compromise, if they focused on the facts and the analysis, that's where I got that from, I said it before, <laughs> and if they were willing to make difficult decisions, they could solve our fiscal problem. But the trouble is you have to have that political will. So here's, here's the, the, I'll say one other word. So I think the average maturity of the U.S. government debt is what, three, three and a half, four years. Yeah. It's relatively short. Yeah. Here's the disturbing part. I wish I could tell you that the Fed had more impact on the 10-year than it does, but the truth is at this stage, it's our own view that most of these rates are market determined. Why? Because of big secular drivers, aging demographics. Right. The disruption that uh, Secretary Rubin talked about, globalization. Uh, there is a flood of liquidity, very high savings in the world that is searching for safe assets. And so this gets back to where we started the conversation tonight. This is why we've, been, we've got to grow faster. Uh, if we grew faster, you'd see the natural rate of interest, we believe, creep up. But one of the byproducts of growing this slowly and these secular headwinds is you've got negative market determined rates. Now central banks, especially by buying out the curve, you know, in Europe are not doing anything to help it. But I think even if central banks weren't in there, a lot of this is market determined, which tells you we've got to grow at higher levels. Because one of the symptoms of growing in a very sluggish way is these, you know, negative real rates. But, but correspondingly, if you reduce the deficit, uh, you're going to reduce, reduce the debt, uh, the growth rate. Right now, if you weren't running six hundred, seven hundred billion dollar deficits, you might have negative growth. I don't agree. For the last 10 I years. actually don't agree with that. I, I think that if we could, if we could get ourselves, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, be fiscally constricted now. But if we could deal with our intermediate and longer term fiscal problems, I think it would I probably. I think there's a real chance it would contribute substantially to our to our growth. I think it would increase confidence. I think it would. Uh, Give us greater, pub more public resources for public investment, so that on the productivity side we would in would improve. I think a lot it would do for to be good for us. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cut, I wouldn't go into a fiscally constrictive mode right now. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, sir. I, first, I'd like to echo the thanks for your being here. It's very helpful for us to to hear your ideas for putting things on the shelf, even if they're not enactable now, for the future, so that once it becomes possible they can be brought down off the shelf and enacted. But my question has to do with, have there been legislative efforts in Congress to enact some of the things that you say in your op-ed piece today that we should be doing in the future? Have there been efforts in the past? And what is your analysis, if there have been, why they have failed beyond that there's political dysfunction? What political or economic or social interests are at stake that have thwarted the efforts to get these things enacted. Well, let me give you one example, and it, it, it melds, the, 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 it, it, if you will, conflates or melds together the, the last discussion we just had and, and this one. Uh, President Obama, about three years ago, don't hold me to when it was, but maybe it was 2011, no, that would be more than three years ago, maybe it was 2012, I don't remember anymore. He proposed a budget in which he wanted ch something called chain CPI, what it actually did was take the, the measure of inflation, which is CPI, and it calculated a different way because there's broad agreement amongst economists that CPI overstates inflation. Well, if you had done that, you would be attaching a more accurate measure of inflation to Social Security benefits. You're not depriving anybody of anything, but you're then really indexing it for inflation as opposed to something with an excess of inflation. And he also wanted to means test Medicare, and he wanted to increase taxes. Although I think not immediately, if I remember correctly, the increase in taxes would take place somewhere down the road. So if you did all of this, you wouldn't be reducing the deficit now, because you're correct, you don't want to reduce the deficit now. But what it would do is it would, be, it would change our longer term trajectory, intermediate longer term trajectory, and reduce deficits projected for the future, and improve our debt to GDP ratio in the future, and I think at least, that would play. Now, members of both parties ran away from this as fast as their little feet would take them. 
because these are very unpopular measures. The payoff is in the longer term, mm. and nobody wanted to engage with these kinds of politically difficult issues. And that, that is, I think, unfortunately representative of, of how our, our congressional system is functioning. Let's take these last two or three more questions. Yes, sir. A uh, quick comment and then a question. As far as trade is concerned, one of the unfortunate things is that words matter. And we often use during the course of discourse terms like fair trade. And people hear that. And it's probably helpful if people would explain perhaps in greater detail what, what trade is about. But, but back to the question, what, uh, uh, what we're talking about growth. Uh, there seems to be a consensus that uh, whoever's elected, there's going to be spending on infrastructure, there's going to be some simplification of corporate tax, there's going to be an effort to pull the $2 trillion back. Uh, that's going to allegedly put us in a box and make it very difficult for us to get any kind of meaningful growth. Do you agree with this, disagree, or have a different point of view? And why do you think if we do infrastructure, and what are the other two you said? Infrastructure, sim simplifying corporate tax code, yep. and being able to repatriate back the oh, $2 trillion. Back dollars. Sure. Correct. Yes, sir. And uh, let me ask you a question, then I'll answer your question. Uh-oh. <laughs> why, do, why do you think that will, that, why do you think that will uh, restrict growth? Well, I think it, based, based on what I've been understanding and hearing, is that you also have the pressures of entitlement spending with no action there. And so it's simply a matter of budget compression. Oh, oh, oh okay. Look, I actually think that if we could do all the things you just said, it would be very constructive. But I think the probability of that happening is very slight. Now, I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I've stayed sort of involved in this stuff a little bit. And I, I know some of the people actually know quite well. Some of the people who are best known in polling and political analysis, stuff like that. And over the last few weeks when I speak to them, what I ask them is the very question you're sort of you're raising, not from an economic perspective, from a political perspective. What are the odds that we'll get infrastructure spending? The problem isn't the infrastructure spending. The problem is how you pay for it. <laughs> and there are those who advocate deficit funding. A lot of people advocate deficit funding. I myself think it's a, as I said earlier, so I'm repeating myself, I think that's a very complex issue. I'm not sure what the right answer is. Maybe that is the ultimately the right answer, but I think it's vastly more complex than it is made to appear, than, than it is, is said to be by those who advocate it, by many of those who advocate it. Some, some recognize the complexity. Uh, the repatriation to pay for the infrastructure, because that's one thing you could do, seems like a good idea, but it gets you into the, into the realm of tax reform. And once you open up the tax reform, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I have a feeling that that isn't going to be a standalone measure, that it's going to get you into other issues. And the more of those issues you get in, the lower the probability of Congress will act. And when you put them all together, I, I think that unless we have a very different environment than I think we're likely to have, I don't think any of this is going to happen. Thank I mean, you. I'll put it differently. I want to say this differently. Everything in life is odds. Nothing is certain. I think the probability of this thing, this sort of thing happening is very low. Now, there's some very thoughtful people of a different view who think there is a real chance we can accomplish what you just said. And it certainly is possible. But uh, I unfortunately think, but I think unfortunately the odds are probably very low. So let's you. take one more question. Yes. I would like to know what your thoughts are on how we can narrow the burgeoning disparity in income, increase the middle class, and where does tax policy come into that? Where does what? Tax policy or oh. tax reform. What part does that play in doing that? Well, that was, <coughs> I think it's imperative if we're, going to, if we're going to succeed economically and socially to accomplish the purpose you just suggested. The op-ed that Rob referred to in the Washington Post, inclusive growth, was sort of addressed or, or aimed, aimed at all of that. I do think we tend to conflate two issues, and I think it's important to keep them separate, although they're related. One is sluggish wages and wage stagnation. And we've had stagnant or, or sluggish, let's say, median real wage growth for a long, long time. 2015 was better, but I, I think if I, my impression based on everything I've seen is that was a one, most likely a one year event. So we need to do all the kinds of measures that I discussed earlier to try to improve the position of middle income and lower income Americans. In terms of tax policy, we're going to have to have additional tax revenues to fund public investment. And they need to be raised, in my opinion, on a progressive basis. So I do think we do need, we are going to need additional revenues. As I said, I should, they should be raised on a progressive basis. Uh, 
and they they can then fund public in, public investment. Other than that, in the tax area, what would you think, Rob? Oh, I, oh, I, another thing I would do. I think the EITC should be expanded, both earned income tax credit, both in its range and in its magnitude. So those are two. Um, the work opportunity tax credit has worked well. I would expand that. There may be other opportunities in that realm. I'm no expert in taxes. What about a VAT? Well, you know, a VAT is an interesting idea. A VAT, <coughs> most, every European country I think has one, or at least if not everyone, most of them do. I think the question for us, though, is can we design it so it'll be progressive? And that's always the challenge with the VAT. So, I, yes, a VAT is, for all kinds of economic reasons, a really good way to raise tax revenues, but you've got to figure out some way. After all, VAT is, is in effect a sales tax in a sense. I mean, not exactly, but in a sense. And so the question is, how do you how do you create a VAT that is progressive so that you don't have the, the contrary, which is to say middle and lower income people being more affected than, than wealthier people? And gonna, that's the challenge. I'm going to ask you one question in closing. Everyone here, obviously, by the fact that here cares about uh, our country, about economic issues, wants to participate. Get this group, uh, I had to give this group one piece of advice on how they can get actively involved. Some of them already are involved. We've got former mayors here and other public officials. But what what are one or two things they could do to an, a, impact the public discourse and maybe uh, help see some of the changes you've talked about happen? You know something I think people should do, Rob? You can write, and then I think it's a really good question. I'm glad you asked. You can write you, you, you can write emails to your whatever your views may be. You're conservative, you're liberal, whatever your views may be. You can communicate with your elected representatives, and you can say whatever else you want to say. You can say, I, as a voter, insist that you commit to governance and that you engage in the principled compromise that is necessary if our system is going to work. You can when you some of you make political contributions, I imagine. Whenever I make a political contribution, I find some way to say to the person I'm making it to, I understand that you have these views, and that's fine. Other people have other views, that's fine. But I am supporting you, and I believe that you should engage in the, in the process of governance. Um, some of you may have the opportunity to write op-eds. Same thing. Whatever you put in there, I put in there something about that. Uh, you go to town halls, and I think at town halls, when you stand up and you say, you know, why don't you agree with me that we shouldn't tax people, that we should tax people, whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you should say, whatever your views may be, I want you to engage in the process of governance. Great. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your leadership.